Welcome to the LaRouche Pack Weekly Report for June the 1st, 2011. I'm John Hopeful, and with me in the studio today are two members of our basement team, Ouyang Ting and Sky Shields, and joining us from Germany is Lyndon LaRouche. So, Lynn, what do you have for us today? Well, we have, a, a, to begin with, an interesting topic of discussion. How long it, uh, it would take in terms of this approximately hour-long event is uncertain, but we still have plenty of things to discuss in addition to this. The, what's been going on is for a long time, essentially since the end of the 19th century, there has been the understanding that in order to understand human life and human relations to the universe, we had to uh, depart from the conventional methods then considered, which, which took eyesight or took the six, uh, five sense version of view and realize that the five senses are not real. This was understood by Max Planck. It was understood by Einstein. They did not at that time have an answer to the problem, but they knew the problem existed that had to be solved. But unfortunately, as World War I came on, it got, things got worse. The uh, science community went crazy. You had uh, the, well, essentially Bertrand Russell was coming in then as a leading figure, and there has been very little science really since that time. Then you had the Solvay conferences of the 1920s. That pretty much destroyed science. It went from being science to being statistics, and statistics is not science. And it just made the whole mess worse. Uh, the, our dear friend uh, Einstein was, in a sense, pushed to one side pretty much. They couldn't get rid of him, but they pushed him to one side. And in the post-war period, after World War II, there was a full-scale lurch in the direction of uh, the crazy people of, uh, <laughs> who were actually did not believe in science at all, but believed in statistics. Von Neumann, for example, who was actually an idiot savant. He was a human calculating machine, but he couldn't think of concepts. He could think of calculations. Uh, it became worse in the post-war period. Economics became totally incompetent. It's how I got to be the best economist around, because I was the one who didn't believe in the rest of them. And I, I started doing forecasting, and I got that. And I pushed more and more in this direction of the belief that sense perception could not be accepted. I had fortunately rejected uh, Descartes, Descartes and similar people, and uh, also the uh, c classical so-called geometry, uh, because as incompetent, and they were incompetent, but people were taught these things. They were taught Euclidean geometry, and Euclidean geometry is intrinsically rotten. It's not, it's, it is a fraud. Um, so, but people believe these things. So therefore, even though we had recognized, as Planck had recognized, and Einstein both notably, that what our sense perceptions, our five sense perceptions, are merely a small fraction of the kind of scientific instruments and various kinds of factors of that type, that we, we have to combine these other instruments with what sense perception can do, which is very little actually, and therefore get a completely different view of the universe. We had to see the mind of the individual, not the sense perception, but the mind as the reality of the, the human characteristics. And that sense perceptions are merely one of the auxiliary agencies which is used for the overall true perception of the universe. Uh, the, this conception was well known about doing that in the time of, uh, well, actually two people, uh, especially uh, Riemann. And uh, their understanding was that the universe is not based on sense certainty. It's sense uncertainty is the truth. And the, you have to find many factors, as Einstein emphasized in the concluding section of his habilitation dissertation. You have to take many factors and use them as a combined force to substitute entirely for a naive sense of sense perception. For example, there is no empty space known to us in the universe. It doesn't exist. 
but you look most of the calculations you are given and the formulas you're given involve space but there is no such thing as empty space it's jammed full of cosmic radiation of all kinds some will kill you some will feed you some will tickle you some will please you <laughs> all these kinds of things and therefore we have to explore the full spectrum of, of cosmic radiation in all its aspects in order to get more and more multiple cofactors which take the place of simply the five sense perceptions and these multiple cofactors give us more and more ways of cross-checking things and getting a mental image of what the reality is out there that our eyes don't see that our ears don't hear eh? and so forth so what uh, well, I've been writing about this thing for some time, and I did it recently on a piece I did, which featured this, and uh, then we went to a second piece, which I just did, which had more on this, and in response to that and this discussion, Sky jumped in on the case with, with chance, and they went to work on a very uh, significant addition to the repertoire I had indicated, that of uh, the... the the medium that he brought into on the question of music. Now, the the fact that mu the key thing here is this: what we think we're seeing is not the truth. It's not the true universe. Hmm? Uh, we we but and it, the fallacy, which is what Sky referred to in his remarks on the subject the, of, of the case of Newton and the case uh, uh, the. Uh, this, this kind of thing, Laplace, these two characters are totally incompetent, but they are still treated as if they were, were scientists, and they are not. They're fakes. So the argument was, as, as, as Guy has made the argument quite effectively, I don't need to repeat that in his own remarks, uh, the, the, fact, the fact of the matter is that uh, the Laplace system the Newton system simply assumes that what has happened is past and w or the future comes before you, but you're never able to find any free will, as Sky has laid this thing out adequately, that you can never find a free will intervention into the universe which will change a simple kinematic chain reaction type of sense, of sense perception. The fact of the matter is, as I have emphasized, and Sky has emphasized in a very a very good way, a very clever way, that we actually, in the universe, when we act to go from point A to point B in a sequence of physical actions, we are not limited to point B being pulled and point A being in the past. Point A is still there, is very much alive. Uh, and this is, this is true in two ways. One place I use it in economics generally, that the... Uh, where the function of what some people call infrastructure, which is actually a sort of a tableau on which things move. Mm -hmm. That is, you can have the same technology of manufacturing, and if you raise the level of technology of the so-called infrastructure, that is the actual the, this table, then you have, you have changed all of the values, resulting values in your system. For example, if you introduce a railway instead of an ox cart system, and you have it every other respect you have a uh, modern economy, your modern economy will be junk. Without the high technology, basic, what we call economic infrastructure often, without that, your pro productivity is very poor. So you have a, a factor that the, the, uh, the, the table, what people call the infrastructure, is a table. And as you move it up the scale, you increase the productivity of everything within it. That is, without changing the manufacturing facilities, without changing anything in production, if you increase the, the basic economic infrastructure, as, as it's called, raise that and you raise the productivity of everything across the board, that is, as a whole. So this is a function of time. Now, if you, in this case, you make a forecast, uh, on one basis, and then you look at what the effect is. For example, if you say you're in manufacturing, uh, you have a manufacturing skill, 
Now you introduce an invention. You don't change anything else in the whole process, manufacturing process. But you, you get a, a technology which you can introduce into this whole process. Now you, pr you introduce this technology somewhere down the line in the process, somewhere in the assembly pro production assembly process. That means you've changed everything. What Sky does with, he, with his representation does exactly the same thing. Is you, he took the case of the, as he's done it, the musical scale. And when you t play, when you perform Bach, Bach system, that is obvious and you can hear it, is that when you add a new note in a sequence or two or three new notes in a sequence to the first, the first is changed in significance. That the, in, the individual note does not have its individual importance, which is what Sky attacks Laplace for. That you don't you you do not leave the past and go into the present and future. That what you do in the future as a change in technology affects the conditions we, from which you started. Just as box composition, method of composition, especially the counterpoint as such. That what you do down the line determines the value of what you did at the beginning of the process. So we're in a world which we know from a physical scientific standpoint, and we have people like Planck and Einstein who uh, pioneered in posing this question. We now realize that we have a different kind of universe than we thought we had. And that when we take all the cofactors in physical space-time, so-called, when all these cofactors are, that you accumulate are added on to the repertoire of five senses, then you have a completely different kind of mind. And it's the poor jerk that believes in sense certainty who is left behind. And it's the poor jerks who believe in sense certainty as such who spoil the pudding for everyone. Because they insist that everything be explained to, by them, to them, in terms of five sense sense perception. And they say, that's what I believe in. Nothing else exists. Nothing else is real. Huh? And when we have that, you have a society which you have some people who are actually scientists, qualified scientists, and you have these average blokes who believe in sense certainty. The, prop, the result is that politically, the mass of the population doesn't understand what you're talking about as a scientist. And therefore, the whole society is crippled by the stupidity of people who've been conditioned to believe only in sense certainty rather than being educated competently. And that's the importance of this for science, that unless we get, as, we, as not being done with, say, the, the question of, of uh, forecasting of earthquakes and tornadoes and so forth, you have to get a great retinue of different uh, perceptors, different kinds of indicators, which are like sense indicators. You add these sense indicators to this little collateral group of five, merely five senses, eh? and thus by taking the larger group of factors. So that's the, that's the vindication of what was intended back at the turn of the century, in the last century, by the work of people leading typical such as Planck and Einstein, that this has introduced us now with the development of new instruments and broader experience into an understanding that there are many things we can create as instruments which supplement our sense perception and are independent of the sense perception in their function. And by accumulating this number of different kinds of perceptions, of synthetic perceptions, and putting them together with the help of the carry boy, the, the water boy, which is our sense perception as such. These higher quality of instruments or combinations of instruments enable us to forecast what the President of the United States, the current President, will always refuse to understand if he were capable of understanding it. And so that is the foundation of science today. We are blocked to the extent that we are limited by a more or less sense perceptual view of the universe. We are blocked from making the kinds of progress which we need to deal with the problems of the present and future. Therefore, our understanding, our breaking of this whole process of sense certainty, which has dominated the planet increasingly, or statistical method, 
Statisticals as generally used in economics are completely fraudulent. They're not worth anything. Statistics prove nothing except the idiocy of the credulous person who believes in them. And you need this kind of, you need this kind of investigation, not sense perception statistics, but this kind of observation, and we can see the future. If we see we, the instruments that are being taken down by this president already have d denied us the power to see the future coming at us. Every time one of those instruments is taken down, you ask how many more people is this president going to murder by taking down these instruments which would enable us to forecast in time to take action which keeps to keep people from being killed or at least minimize that. So this idea of time and the, and the reversibility of time in, in, that, in the sense we've described it is an absolutely essential feature for any science of the present and future. And the old system has to go. So therefore, the more we do in this area, whether we do it in terms of entertainment, whether you do it in terms of physical science, experimentation, it's all the same thing. It's all supplements in the form of synthetic sense perceptions of many different qualities, which enables by taking the co convergence, just the same way that uh, Kepler discovered gravitation, by taking two sense perceptions, one line of sight, a line of sight image of the organization of the solar system. Second, harmonics, a completely different sense. And by combining the paradoxical juncture of these two kinds of senses, he was able to discover the principle of universal gravitation. And what we're doing today with these many kinds of instruments, as sense perception instruments, is simply following in the footsteps of the precedent of the discovery of gravitation by Kepler, a, a discovery which was understood by Einstein to have redefined the universe as being finite, not of infinite size, but finite, but not bounded. In other words, it's a self-defining universe, which he adduced from the mere fact of the nature of the discovery of gravitation by Kepler. Today, we're walking the same track. Today, however, we've got to re-educate people to understand what is actually being done by scientists and related other people around the world. That by developing the use of more instruments, more studies of the combinations of these instruments, looking at the paradoxes we generate and the evidence when we combine more and more kinds of instruments, this is the, this is the wave of the future. This is the way that can see man safely into space. No, it's significant. Uh, it might be worth revisiting a point you've made in the past about statistics, which is that, which I think gets right to the core of the time question in a real clear way, which is that the real crime of statistics is the assumption that somehow there is such a thing as a present state of affairs, which in and of itself can give you any kind of reading on where you actually stand. The idea that somehow you've got some state of the, of the economy, say, that you could describe, when in reality, you can't define any economic value, you can't, deny, you can't define any serious economic measure in the present because it's defined by the states that you intend to reach in the, in the future. What would seem well, to be the problem the, is it's a, it's a statistical state that you, <clears throat> they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And statistics don't tell you anything. You may attribute things to statistics, but that's an attribution made on assumptions which are outside the statistics themselves. Mm -hmm. when you, even mm -hmm. when you use a method, of statistical method, you're applying a method which is your choice, yes. and the result you get from the statistics depends upon your choice. Mm -hmm. huh? what's, what's an independent fact there? A purely mathematical statistical system is intrinsically incompetent. Most of the great fakery in economics is done by people who rely on statistics to try to define what's going on in the economy. Right, right. You have to know what the intention is of the way the economy is being designed. Mm -hmm. That will tell you what's going to happen, mm -hmm. not statistics. Mm -hmm. That's why I was always right in these things, and every one of my rivals was always wrong. Back since 1954, well, mm -hmm. back since then, every forecast I made have come in exactly as I defined it. It's never been based on statistics. For example, the first forecast I made was back in 1956, uh, actually, on the 
I forecast that as of the conclusion of, of February or the beginning of March of the following year, there would be a general breakdown degree of, of a crisis in the U.S. economy. And it came exactly as I forecast, and nobody else had it. They were all using statistics. I was using the facts I knew about the auto industry. Okay. And I knew their lending practices. I knew their credit practices. I knew the swindle, which was their contract agreements with the, with the dealerships. Um, it was a swindle. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, they used statistics, and they were always wrong. I used the other method, the physical method, right. the real method. What are the factors that are going into this behavior? What's controlling this behavior? What's the kind of mental behavior I can induce that is guiding the people who are making the policies which are leading to this result? So it's forecasting, not statistical forecasting. Statistical forecasting is the least reliable of all kinds of forecasting. No, and it seems because it's based on assumptions, purely abstract mathematical fun functions, which have no correspondence to any system. When what you're describing, the kind of real forecasting, seems to bring the discussion squarely back into the realm of the cognitive. That it's no longer yes. something, you're not describing some abstract thing called an economy, you're describing the expression of human mind in the physical universe, the way mind expresses itself. Well, well look, at our, look at us today. Look at how much the influence of human behavior and the effects of human behavior have shaped everything that is significant, practically everything significant, about this planet. Huh? Mm -hmm. So it's our understanding of these, these processes which are largely influenced increasingly by the role of mankind and the role of, of the mind of mankind. The Earth is getting to be more and more, from its surface levels out, is more and more a creation of the human mind, of the collective effects of the human mind's actions. Mm -hmm. And most of the things that happen can be forecast on the basis of some SOB doing it, deciding to do it. Now, the SOB may not know what the effect is he's creating, but he's creating the effect, and an effect which is undesirable, simply because he says that he knows that the way things should work, and his method will tell you what's going to happen, and it very, very rarely does. Um, except you punch a guy in the nose, he most may bleed. That 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 is predictable, <laughs> but other things are a little less reliable. Practical cause and effect. I mean, it's interesting <laughs> also going back to the history because the statistical approach that uh, that you fought, you know, that really kind of was the the fire out of which your career as an economist, you know, came. Um, that whole idea of systems analysis was an explicit rejection of the trend in science before, you know, before and around the time of the Solvay conference, which you brought up. I mean, the divergence was so clear coming out of that conference. Yeah. Whereas, you know, before, uh, you, you brought up Planck, Planck and Einstein. You know, Planck's collaboration at that time with um, uh, Wolfgang Kohler and people involved in the, in the Gestalt psychology movement is instructive because, you know, the Gestalt psychologists were saying, it's, you have to separate this naive sense perception from, first of all, what your actual perceptions really are. The fact is you don't ever really perceive point sources. You know, your visual field is completely determined by context, um, which people probably know, you know most popularly through visual illusion. But then he took it further in saying that if, you, if you're able to establish the basis for that kind of gestalt, the, the, the gestalts in perception, then you also have to recognize that the physical universe is organized that way, that gestalts are actually real and not simply psychological in the sense that they're in a separate category. Mm -hmm. And I thought the video that, that you guys just put out on the, um, you know, using the, the pedagogy of music, again, now takes that to a further level of saying that if you're going to get into the domain of creativity, gestalts and creativity, then music is the most provocative, it's the most provocative mm -hmm. area to do that in. And you have to pose the, the same question, which is, here's a real phenomenon of experience that people know in listening to music. Now, instead of saying, how do you fit that into your pre-existing notion of the universe, how do you redefine the un a universe which, in which the, those kinds of processes are possible? Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. so it's, it's interesting that it, it's su such a clear division that this was the, the directionality 
right. you know, before World War II. And out of that, everything that's come to be called science today is almost a bizarro pseudoscience that really never should have been. It never really, sh it never should have mm -hmm. taken that course. Well, economic statistics, you know, you look at the way in which they've been used to brainwash everybody, that this long decline, this buildup of this financial parasite, but the long decline of the physical economy, to the point where everything is now <coughs> collapsed and we're headed into a death spiral. And all along the way, we've had statistics mm -hmm. which show us we're getting better. Mm -hmm. Things are improving, the recovery. The recovery is here. You know, we're all these uninterrupted months of economic recovery during all these years. And then it all blows up and they keep telling us, look, but the statistics show the recovery is here. Mm -hmm. The jobs aren't quite here yet. But there is no recovery. Well, the whole the, thing the is a complete don't fraud. Lie. That's the that's yeah. the rallying cry of the yeah. statis statisticians. Except that the whole thing is a lie. Right. No, it's that's an intentional lie. It's an intended lie, like Wall Street. Oh, look, anybody who's a junior accountant and free to th do a little bit of thinking knows that what they did, beginning back in especially the 1970s was we started but then really the 1980s worse and so forth the whole system could all have no result but what it had you are cutting production per capita per square kilometer you're cutting it huh? you're cheapening things you are destroying sections of the economy you are lowering the productive powers of people which has been going on since kennedy was assassinated step by step they've been taking things down down down. Mankind was being less productive. Raw materials were being depleted. And the failure to develop new kinds of raw materials meant that the depletion of the old raw materials was drying you down. You were going down, down, down. The educational system, the way in which people were motivated, the long Vietnam War, all these things were factors that brought everything down, down, down. Now you have somebody in Wall Street that says, well, we have this new system of gambling. And you can gamble, and some of you will win if you know how to cheat. And that's what you get as forecast. A Wall Street forecast is actually in the long run what the British Empire has made clear it means right now, what Her Majesty means. Exactly. We are fooling people by convincing them that they're going to get money, and they're going to get more money, but they can't spend it. Because they're not they're not producing anything. They're producing less and less. So eventually, all this money, which is added up in various ways by gambling upon gambling upon gambling, obviously the people who built this system know what they did. They knew they were out to destroy society, and get the suckers to believe in the system, and the suckers who wanted to be respectable wanted to hope they could steal a little money too or cheat a little bit too, find themselves one day out of work without a country, <laughs> practically, as in the case of governance in Europe and so forth. It's out of business. But they intended this. If you look at the history of the Roman Empire, since the first Roman Empire, then the second Roman Empire, Byzantium, the third Roman Empire, the Crusader system, the fourth Roman Empire, the British system, the British Empire, they all did the same thing. They always had a period where they would build up power physically. Then they would say, this is getting out of control. People are going to get intelligent and strong. They're going to take it away from us. We've got to destroy the system again. And that's what they do. So it was, it was on the top level, when people like EIG, huh? the original AIG, they knew exactly what they were doing. You take their operation in the Philippines, I know exactly what they were doing. That's AIG, the insurance racket. You had the legal profession was in on it. The lawyers decided that they were going to make a killing by these medical law, uh, lawsuits. Huh? And they ran the thing up. Then what happens? So the charges now to the doctors with all these fees paid out to people on so-called medical malpractice cases pile up. The whole thing goes up. Then AIG and other people come in, and they create the racket. You have automobile insurance. How was it created? The automobile insurance, compulsory automatic insurance business, was a racket. They had a medical health care insurance, a racket. 
You don't think that they knew this was going to happen? The people who designed this? Of course they knew it was going to happen. Do they knew that they were putting out paper money, which is not even paper money? It's electronic phantom image of money? And this is the debt that we're supposed to bail out? A non-existent value? We're supposed to bail it out? Flush the toilet, boy. Get rid of that stuff. <laughs> huh? And so there's no... The, the people are, well, the real problem with people is they think what happens to them is somehow, oh, oh, you know, the creator did it or something else did it. We should, that's our money. We should have that money. Somebody took it away from us. It was never worth anything. But they believed it was worth something. So they would go out and borrow money against the non-money. And that would be fake. And they'd have to go out and borrow more non-money to bail out the other non-money. And that becomes a, a threat toward hyperinflation, which is what we're on the edge of right now. Right. So people who believe in the education they got in accounting school or Harvard University or Columbia University, these, these areas, they were being duped. They were being trained, except for a few of them who were really criminals who really understood and loved crime. But those who thought they were actually learning a profession were kidding themselves. This is all fake. And the problem you have today, when you're trying to deal with this, you're dealing with these two problems. You've got the problem of the people. The average person is not educated to have any accurate understanding of the world they live in. They believe in things which are purely myths. They count on them. They tell, they're told that their five sense perceptions are all they have, and they believe it. Hmm? And they will base an opinion firmly on five sense perception, which we know is a, not a good indicator of reality these days. So the, the population becomes a bunch of suckers. And those of us who know something about what really is happening are the tiny minority. You get a room full of the average person, the room full of average persons will tell you they believe in nonsense, what is absolutely nonsense because they were told and trained to believe in it. And therefore, because of that, they're suckered. The Wall Street, the whole Wall Street game, the whole London game, all this stuff is pure swindle. Mm -hmm. And people should go to, to jail for just doing it. Because it's a, it's a destruction of the economy to introduce fake money as if it were value. It's not redeemable. It's not credit. It's fake money. And that it's the, 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 this is the greatest problem. By, by keeping people stupid by these various kinds of tricks, they believe they're educated because they've been learned these tricks, like statistics. When in fact and it's training in them. It. You say it's yeah. training people not to think. The idea of, it's, this makes clear, because sometimes you get this funny pessimism that, oh, people are just like that. People are just controlled by their senses. People are just... But it's not true. There's a policy to get a population that behaves in that way. Because you, if you have a population that identifies primarily with their sense perceptions, you've got a population that can be controlled in this way, that will believe a statistical description of reality. There's the whole point of statistics, as you're saying, is to, it's to disguise intent. But then going back to our first time question, it, it's significant to really think, well, what do you mean when you say that there is an intent to do something? That's sort of an amazing thing, if you think about it, from the standpoint, it's something that completely throws out the idea of linear clock time, because the very idea of having an intent means that you're acting on a future state in such a way that that future state is acting on what you recognize to be the present. Yeah. That if you're capable it's a time of function again. Exactly. It's your time function again. Exactly. And it's you existing in that. Well, it, the, other, the other thing is fun. The, the which, as I pointed out, you know, which is why you and Chance are having such fun, that the real highest level of knowledge that man has ever achieved is in the imagination, mm -hmm. and it, imagination is expressed by classical artistic composition. This is the area of the imagination in which the ideas of what might what might be happening if, are found. And then it, when the, you are inspired by these, this classical kind of artistic and equivalent education, then you are able to make discoveries guided by the inspiration of these 
forms of classical Odessic composition. So you have you don't have science as leading in human progress. You have the imagination leads in human progress. Right. Progress is going where you weren't never went before. Progress is going to doing something that you never knew before and making it successful. And how do you do that? With the imagination. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you do that? With the principle of metaphor. The role of metaphor in poetry, in drama, gives you an imagination. Now take that, that idea from the stage, from classical artistic composition, take that idea into the laboratory. And a scientific thinker will be inspired by these models, which are often literary models or things like that. And they will inspire people to say, wait a minute, where did I get that idea? And they make a discovery. So the, the leading edge of the distinction of mankind from the beast is the artistic, the classical artistic imagination, where the f ideas of what has not yet been done are forged. And it's from those ideas which then in turn guide and inspire scientific and related progress. Mm -hmm. Right. And, right. And therefore, the, the imagination is crucial. And to draw out, you've made the point that, which I think is worth drawing out, in the, in the first of the papers in this series on the, uh, the uh, when governments crumble, you made the point that what you're really doing, it's wrong to say that there's something called mind and imagination that's studying some other thing called universe. That in reality, what you're doing, the real investigation is mind investigating mind. And removing that, that, that's very important. I mean, it's important because you can't have any progress without it. But then taking it out leads to a very serious moral slippery slope. Because if you believe that there's some one set of principles that apply to mind and some other set of principles that apply to the rest of the universe, you set yourself up for the argument that you get the, we were discussing the other day, the liberal fascist argument, which says that, well, I know what you're saying is right in principle. I agree with you in principle. I agree that we shouldn't let people be foreclosed on. I agree that we shouldn't be throwing families out of their houses. I agree that we shouldn't have people starving in n different nations of the world. But don't you have to pay attention to reality? Reality is there's only so much to go around. Reality is we're in this, we're in this state. We have to be realistic. Then you're bringing in the statistics, and you're getting people to look at the current state of, uh, current state of affairs as though it were completely defined, and you're ignoring the fact that it's an intention that's driving the process. And so that's, as soon as you make that separation between mind and so-called objective reality, then you're introducing the wrong idea of time as a corollary. You're introducing the Newtonian Laplacian idea of time as a corollary, and you're destroying the ability to act as actual moral human beings for the sake of humanity. It's a, all those go hand in hand. Precisely, precisely that. That's exactly it. Well, I have a question on that. I mean, it seems like as far as experimental science goes, it seems like when you begin to think about, for example, what's being raised here about time, it's clear, at least initially seems clear uh, in the realm of experiment in, say, the extremes of physics, you know, whether it's going in the very small or the very large astrophysical domains. Um, you know, and that's generally physics per se. It seems easier and more controllable. You go to the next level, which, which Vernadsky raised about the questions of, of time and really space-time in, in living processes as subsuming those lower processes. And experimentally, it still seems there's, there's areas to go. It seems a little bit less clear about how to control certain things mm -hmm. uh, to get clear conclusions. And then, of course, he's already laying the table for the next stage in terms of the noosphere, that th then you have a subsuming domain above that. The question that I have uh, for you, Lynn, is in terms of, in, you know, as opposed to the, the sort of extremes of, of, of experience in terms of the microphysical or the astrophysical, uh, like, where do you place human uh, economic, you know, human social organization uh, in, in terms of, of actually acting as, as policy on those questions, on the question, uh, you know, that, that you're raising. It's, it's, 
to me, still a little bit unclear how that gets taken into the domain um, of economic forecasting and policy making. It's easier for me because of the advantage of my age that uh, what happened in the post-war period, post-World War II period, was a systemic destruct destruction of the ability to think among people, among in the United States and in Europe in particular, which I know the best. Now you had the Congress for Cultural Freedom, which was a factor, and similar kinds of phenomena. There was a, the spread of existentialism, which is a mental disease, the same kind of problem. So, so in these targeted science, yes, but the primary target was in so-called classical arts, art forms, mm. especially in music. Now, music is, 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 is classical music is very significant, particularly because of the factor of, of Bach, because this introduced an organization, a systemic organization, a musical composition based on a multi-voice system. That this this it, it made it expanded what the human mind's imagination would could do. This overlapped into other areas of classical artistic composition. But what did you get instead? You got existentialism. And existentialism, and various kinds of approximation of it, dominated. The uh, science education became dominated by statistical mathematics, not science. It became that sort of thing. So you, we had a s systemic destruction of a certain collective cultural advantage, which people in Europe and the people in the United States generally had, at least large, a large part of them. They've lost that. They were actually rendered relatively stupid, functionally, by these things. They learned to learn things that don't require insight, mm -hmm. to learn things that, that, like a trick. They could learn the trick, mm -hmm. te teaching a dog to uh, perform a trick. And that's what's killed us. It's the general cultural outlook and the intent of culture. It was they have culture, the, the cultural development of the mind and personality, habits of a people, is extremely, that's the people. It's not money, it's, not, it's the habits of the people. It's the culture of the people. Huh? Mm -hmm. And it's the, then the, the creative function of culture, the, the, the imagination, the creative classical the artistic imagination is the driver of science. If you don't have that driver, you lack what's called inspiration. And you produce gimmicks rather than insights into new principles. And we have to a large degree lost that. And as I'm now, you know, here I am approaching 89 very soon, when most of my people of my generation are dead. Or if they're not dead, most of them are non-functional. Those remain. They are no longer an influential factor in shaping the average way policy is made, policy is accepted or not accepted. Then you have the, the baby boomer generation, which was essentially a destroyed generation, in which the destruction, essentially the killing of Kennedy, which was deliberate on the part of very powerful forces, and the killing of his brother, Robert, who was a threat because he might been, become the next president of the United States. They killed him too. We went through the 68 phenomenon as a result of this, and this was what did it. June 68, huh? the murder of Bobby Kennedy was a turning point where everything got nasty. And the generation, if you didn't have gonorrhea, you weren't, you weren't social. <laughs> And this whole generation, this whole generation became the leading generation, which was used by the oligarchy at first, and then it was selected and trained to be used, and they became leading influences in politics, in universities, so forth. The, the, the freak, you know, the, the acid head freak, of the, 19, of the 1970s became the political leader of the 1980s. This was the kind of trend. That's what we have today. We have a crippled population, a crippled culture, and only a great crisis can break the bonds of that, triple, of that culture. We're going to have that great crisis. We're having it right now.
we are in an impossible situation. If Glass-Steagall is not enacted, probably before, say, the 3rd of July, the day before the 4th of July, if it's not enacted, there may be no chance for civilization. Because only the United States now could launch the initiative through Glass-Steagall, which would restore our economy and would force a restoration of the economy of Europe and would save China and India from going down, despite their apparent greater strength today. It lies with us to give up all other concerns, those of us who care, but to say we're going to get Glass-Steagall through because it's the only thing, action, that enables us to save our nation. And when we save our nation, it gives us the leverage to help other nations save theirs. And we get rid of this governance nonsense and other forms of Hitler-like obscenity and get this president out of the office. He's a mental case. He's qualified under Section 4 of the 25th Amendment to go out as a mental case. He should be carried out to his succor and relief in some distant place from the White House. But if these actions are not taken, people who are still complacent and say it's all going to pass away, it's all going to be all right. You see, it's bad times now, but it's good times are coming. Oh, the president's got a new idea. People in Europe got a new idea, a new kind of society. It's going to be just wonderful when it happens. We're going to paradise now. It's going to be a little rocky on the way to get there. Yeah. But since they're going to die in the process, who's going to hold them to account mm -hmm. for having lied? And that's where we are now. And the problem is we have to recognize that there has been great intellectual, emotional damage to our population with the passing of my generation, almost totally now, and the incapacitation of the baby boomer generation, because baby boomers now are beginning to get into incapacities, not, you know, increasing rate, incidence of it. And they're going to be out of business soon. By the end of this decade, they'll be out of business. And then what's left? You have nothing. You haven't trained anybody in science. You haven't trained them in skills. Most of our young people under 25 don't know anything. You couldn't get them to do anything because they don't even begin to know how to do anything that's important. We had destroyed our own nation with the policies, especially in the past 10 years. With George W. Bush Jr. and Obama, that has been the ruin the final blow of ruin of our United States. And it's this that has put this hell up on us. We were still alive under, under the former president, eh, Clinton. But under the two followers, two successors, we've lost it. And only a very radical and sudden shift, which puts us back on go, will save this nation. And it's not something in the far distant future. It's a decision that's going to have to be made in the weeks now, because if we don't make, if we don't get Glass-Steagall through by the beginning of July, it is doubtful that we will ever recover. Makes clear why incremental steps right now are absolutely useless. Because, I mean, the kind of thing that you're describing about a generational, you know, a generational gap that's really profound, um, is not something you can. You can't really build that up stepwise. It seems like at this point, the only way that you can get that kind of cultural upshift is, is through the actual experience of a radical upshift, of actually accomplishing a mission. You know, something akin to, you know, in the living experience of people alive today, maybe the space program, but on a more, a much broader level. Because it seems... Like the, Egypt, the Egypt Revolution is a good example of that. It was a mass strike effect, which brought a new government into power in Egypt. We had other symptoms of that, but they weren't powerful enough to over overwhelm this international system, which is crushing those kinds of movements. Mm. But mm -hmm. we get into the point that everybody else, everybody's running out of options. There may be, are there probably a handful of people, as percentage-wise, in this population which is not running out of options for the future. We're draining, we're getting to the bottom of the barrel, and then we find there's no bottom there. But that's where we are. And therefore, we, we have to recognize that our, our people out there 
have been crippled by what's happened to the past three generations. Successive decay in the culture in the United States, Europe, and elsewhere. And that culture is what, that generation is what we're looking at now. The question is, do we have the will, like a man rising out of his coffin before he's carried off, to get out of that coffin and to go out there and take the action which will put the world back into business? We can do it. I know exactly how to do it. It can be done. But the will to do it has to be there. If we can get the will to get Glass-Steagall enacted by early July, we can save this nation. If we can't, I don't think there's much of a hope for any of us. I think that, that's a fair assessment. You know, if, if we don't do it, we're doomed. It's already locked in under the current policies. There is no choice. Either we pass Glass-Steagall, either we change this policy along the lines that you've identified, or there is no alternative. We're all going to hell. So, mm -hmm. People have illusions that that can't happen, but it can happen. It's yeah. happened often in history before. Yeah. And I'll add that this is, just a note, back to the same time question again. The idea of no incremental change really is stating that there's no extrapolation from this present state that can get you anywhere. But if you can identify a clear future state where humanity belongs, act on that in such a way that it draws you forward from where you are here. You've got that clear reciprocal action across time. If you can do that, you get these huge, what seem to be huge discontinuous changes that are in no way deducible from the, from the current state. But that's the proper human experience of time. That's the only one that we can, we can live in that'll let us survive. So this is the platform idea of economics that you have exactly. to has to act on all levels simultaneously mm -hmm. in that sense. Yeah, we have we have the projects. We can name the projects that will do it. We have the WAPA project, which is typical of that. The WAPA project, which would mean right off the hand, four million jobs right away. Mm -hmm. Not not immediately realized, but but four million jobs are on the line. Then you take the it. We've destroyed our railway system. We've destroyed much of our trunk system, our power systems, and other things. That will give you another couple million jobs. So if you want to talk about getting seven or eight million jobs, which are really productive jobs, back into business in this economy, you can do it. Class, you know, just pass Glass-Steagall and take these kinds of projects plus putting the repair process back into the states which have been ruined by this shakeout. Help the states recover. Get the essential institutions in there in each of these states. But at the same time, drive the whole thing by a high technology driver program, largely with engineering, scientists driven engineering programs. Mm. You can get about 7 million jobs of that type off the, right off the top of the list. It's possible right now. We just have trouble finding the people who are qualified to do those jobs. But we can train them. We can bring them into training programs. We've done it before. And we can, we can rebuild this nation if we want to. If we want to badly enough to fire the president, who is a mental case, and therefore should be out of office because he's a mental case. He shows that all the time. And get some of the Wall Street. We don't care if Wall Street goes to hell. We don't need it. We've had too much Wall Street. What we need is a good commercial banking system, a good American-style classical ba good commercial banking system with a decent interest rate. Huh? Not an exorbitant one, not a too cheap, maybe 2% baseline. Huh? On that basis, with a high rate of gain of productivity, we can do what has to be done. And we have some horrible choices to make, in part, on some of the things we have to do. But we can win. And that's what's important. Well, maybe before we end, I think it's just worth, to, worth it to point out that when you defined the Nawapa project last summer, it was, it was a definition not just of jobs creation, not just of a, a reindustrialization of the country, but it was redefining the relationship between the human species and our, what's, known, what's called our environment. In, from a sort of a passive to an active role. And you said that this is going to be a necessary 
uh, platform from which to have a revival of the space program. And now if you take those two concepts, you know, fast forward from August of last year to the spring and summer of this year, you see exactly where the lack of that, that perspective has put us, where we're, we're being destroyed. Again, something that, that you, know, you would forecast uh, in pretty explicit terms, that we're facing an increase in these kinds of extreme weather events. And you, know, you can see in kind of negative relief the importance of these other, this, not just these policies, but this kind of paradigm. That this is the way that you're, you have to actually take an active uh, approach, an active role in, in shaping, uh, you know, in acting on the, the underlying basis of the environment. And that, that seems to be what, how you would define physical economy. It, it really defines not just our relationship to our immediate environment, it really defines our relationship to, you know, our, our, the global environment, but also into the future. Right. It's sort of as, as universal as you can. It, it's it's the place where you take you universalize an individual's experience to all of humanity. It has to be done f- from the standpoint of economic policy, because mm-hmm. without that, we're just stuck here, getting slammed by you know a hyperinflationary crisis and getting slammed by these weather events, and the net result of that is, uh, or maybe the best expression of that is Obama saying, you know, this is just the way it is. This is just the way it is, and there's nothing we can do about it. When we put him into the slammer, and we close the door and lock it, <laughs> someone will speak to him through the grill in the doorway. That's just the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. All right, on that note, uh, that wraps it up for this week, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. <laughs>